see that symbol there, that's rho, R-H-O, Greek. That stands for density, and it's mass divided by volume. And one of the most important standards is the density of water. The density of water is 1,000 kilogram per meter cube. You've got to know that. 1,000 kilogram per meter cube, and that happens at 4 degrees Celsius. And uh, when you look at that, you also see that the unit of density is kilogram per meter cube. You see that? Mass by volume. It's going to get rough and tough before then. I want to keep it easy. But I promise you, if you listen throughout this chapter, it'll be easy. Otherwise, no. Okay. Pressure in fluids. Pressure is force by area. There you have the second form. Pressure is force divided by area. I think I told you about talked about a lady stepping on my... Yes. Okay, so I told you. And then I introduced pressure. And I told you that smaller the area, the bigger the pressure. Now, the bigger the pressure, right? Because the area is in the denominator. And I also told you that the unit of pressure is Pascal, which is Newton per meter squared. Mm -hmm. But what's added there is a very important concept that you see here that the pressure is the same in every direction in a fluid. Why didn't it draw? Okay, it took time. Pressure is the same in every direction in a fluid at a given depth. You know the meaning of depth, don't you? So as you go down into the fluid, the pressure increases. But at the same level, it'll be the same. As long as you don't change the height or the depth, the pressure will be the same at all points. Okay, after, we, uh, after I give you the next formula, I'll ask you a very interesting question. The pressure exerted by a fluid is rho GH. Again, rho is the density of that fluid. G is the, well, you're used to that, acceleration due to gravity, 9.8, and H is the height or depth. So if the height is zero, what's the pressure due to the fluid? Zero. And as the height increases, the pressure also increases. And see, this formula is correct for any liquid whose density does not change with depth. That means the density is assumed to be constant. All right? Now, that's where I bring this uh, interesting question. I'm going to... Try to draw a container, two containers. Okay, there's one. One container is this one. I'm trying to draw it as neatly as possible. Another one is like this. And both these containers have the same liquid and to the same height. So you have the liquid in both, the same liquid to the same height. And my question is, I want you to compare the pressure at the point A and the pressure at point B. A and B are at the bottom of both the containers, right? The, the liquid is the same. The height is the same. I want you to compare the pressures at A and B in the two containers. And you know the 15 second rule. So think for 15 seconds. Don't even say it. <coughs> How many of you think you got the answer? Let me see your hands. All right. All right. Okay. Who wants to go for it? Uh, go, Brett. Uh, the pressure at the bottom of B is greater than A. James? I was going to say it was the same. Gary? Anybody else? Ask me. Henry? Oh, I think they're the same. Arthur? The, same. the pressure is the same. Because the formula for pressure is rho GH. And I tried to say that the height is the same for both, isn't it? Look at the height. 
Look at the height of the liquid. Isn't it the same for both? It is the same. Isn't it the same liquid? So the density is the same and G is the same. Now, obviously, what you are thinking is there is more liquid in this container. Yes, there is. And so there's a bigger weight acting. That's what you're thinking. But that weight is acting over a bigger area. Do you see that? And the small weight is acting on a smaller area. Come on now. So when you divide, the pressure is going to be the same. Even if I had a tiny, what do you call it in chemistry? You call it a pipette? You know what a pipette is? If you fill that pipette with the same liquid, and you know that's tiny, right? With the same liquid at the same height, the pressure at the bottom of that will be the same. Or if you can imagine even a smaller container than a pipette, which is very difficult for me to imagine. But okay, it'll be the same. All right, so get sure. yes. we did. <coughs> Excuse me. I told you that the atmospheric pressure is really huge, right? And that's the number. 101325 Newton per meter squared is the atmospheric pressure. You need to remember that number. That is what you call one atmosphere in chemistry. We don't use it in physics. We use the unit Pascal or Newton per meter squared. Good question. Very good question. At sea level, yes. Because as you go up, the pressure decreases. That's the normal atmospheric pressure. And uh, if you read this, and if you can read, then you see that we don't get crushed because, I told you, our cells... Not used yes. to it. <laughs> There's an internal yeah, pressure yeah, inside yeah. the cells trying to balance this. So that's about as atmospheric pressure. Now, one big difference here, get used to these two terms. There are two. One is called the gauge pressure, PG. The other is called the absolute pressure. Hmm, they put it. Okay. Here, according to this formula, P is the absolute pressure. P is the absolute pressure and PA is the atmospheric pressure. Let me say that again. PA is atmospheric pressure. PG is the gauge pressure. What do you mean by gauge pressure? If you use a pressure gauge and uh, measure the pressure in a tire, that's what you're going to get, PG. Come on. So, I say such things. What is Pascal's principle? Simple. You see, the unit of pressure is given in the name of that scientist, Pascal. And his principle is that if you apply a pressure on a liquid, it will transmit that pressure equally in all directions. Got it? You apply a pressure on a liquid, it will transmit that pressure in all directions. That's exactly what you do when you apply brakes in a car. Look at that diagram. On the right side, if you look at the diagram on the right side, you are applying force on the brake pedal, which is this one, and there's a master cylinder there filled with a fluid. That's a brake fluid. And that, break, that one branches out and is connected to all the four beads. Well, only one is shown here. You see that? Now, if you watch carefully, you see that the diameter here is much bigger than the diameter here. Are you watching? Mm -hmm. So what's going to happen is, the pressure that you apply here, that liquid is going to transmit it equally, not just to one tire, but to all the four tires. Isn't that great? And you know that if brakes don't act perfectly on all the four tires at the same time, your car is going to go in a different direction. Now, it does not happen because a liquid transmits pressure equally in all directions. You got it? There's no other way to do it except to use a liquid. If you had a mechanical system where you had rods and all that, you would never make it transmit equally. The pressure would be a little bit bigger somewhere, and that's dangerous, especially if you're driving fast and you're applying sun brakes. Ooh, you go on to one side. That make sense? So that's the principle. Of brakes, and you can that's an extra credit opportunity right there. You can read on the brake system and really investigate and get me a diagram and tell me how it works. 
If the pressure applied is F in by A in, what is the pressure on the other side? Okay, I know you're going to say F out by A out. Wait, wait. F out by A out is correct. What's the relation between the two? They have to be equal because of Pascal's principle. Because according to Pascal's principle, whatever pressure you apply here has to be transmitted to the outer one, correct? Okay, so equate them. Go ahead, equate them and make F out the subject. Go. Make F out the subject. So you would have written F in by A in is equal to F out by A out. I'm saying make F out the subject. What do we get? Do you get F out is A out by A in times F in? Well, I kind of rearranged. Is this correct? So what do you get? Yes. And what can you tell me about this ratio? Is it bigger than one or smaller than one? Smaller or bigger? Bigger. What does that mean? So if this is like 10, that means the F out is 10 times the... So you magnified the force, didn't you? It's not so difficult to understand if you are listening. So if the ratio of A out to A in is 100, that's usually the ratio. That means you magnified the force how many times? 100 times. So if you apply a 20 Newton force, you're going to get it as 20 times 100. You're going to get 2,000 Newton there, which is enough to lift a car. That's the idea of the hydraulic jack system. Have I answered your question a little bit, please? So if you change the area of cross-section, you can magnify the force. But if, when you come to the brake cylinder, brake system, what you're seeing is only one of those. Remember, there are four of these. So when you take the area of all those four, it'll add up to be much bigger than the area of the master cylinder. That's why I wanted to explain this. The atmospheric pressure is 76 centimeters of mercury. Correct? This was done by an Italian scientist. Oh, I see his name. Torricelli. Torricelli was the first one who did this. This is what he did. He took this big tube. One side is open, look. He filled it with mercury. Let's say the total length is like 100 centimeters. Are you listening? 100 centimeters? And then he inverted this into a trough containing mercury. Well, while he inverted it, he closed the open end, you know, and then after carefully putting it under mercury, he took his thumb off or whatever he closed it with. And he saw that the mercury started coming down. But the mercury came down and stopped exactly at what? Why isn't it coming down? What's holding it there? Which pressure? Acting where? There, pushing down, and liquids transmit pressure. I think that made sense. So the atmosphere is pressing down on the surface, and that is transmitted and holding the entire weight of the mercury column. So if you use H rho G here, where H is, I think we did this, didn't we? 0 0.76 in meters, density of mercury is 13,600, times G is 9.8, you would get 101325 approximately. That makes sense. Hold on, guys. Uh, we are going to talk about the density of the fluid, and we could also talk about the density of the solid. You see the danger? Because there's a... Now, that's where most students get confused, because they just will not think. They'll only look at the numbers, and they don't know what to plug in there. Right now, what are we talking about? What's that row? is the density of fluid. So if the fluid is water, what's the value? Not one. That was in chemistry. That's why I asked you. It's 1,000. In chemistry, it was one gram per centimeter cube, which is also correct. But we don't use gram per centimeter cube. We use kilogram per meter cube. Okay, so the density of water is 1,000. G is 9.8. A is the... Okay, area of cross-section H2 minus H1. And what's the next step? Look at the next step. 
What's that? Which is the height of the cylinder. Da. Isn't delta H the height of the cylinder? Because delta H is... Okay, now be careful. What is A times delta H? Volume of what? The of the cylinder, of the solid. Okay, hold on. Hold on. Wouldn't that be the same as the volume of fluid displaced? Yes. Because it's completely immersed? I want to stop there. Just because the solid is completely immersed, you're going to see the level of the liquid rise up when you put that solid inside. I'm saying the level that rises up, the volume that rises up, is going to be exactly the volume of the solid. Did you get it? Yes. Because it's completely immersed. But is that the truth always? What if the solid was only partially immersed, like half inside? Now, now what's the volume of liquid displaced? Half of the, That's where people get confused. Next. They can't think. There's volume of the solid, okay. Volume of fluid, why should it be half? Well, because only half of it is in, immersed. I'm trying to make you do problems without numbers. You see, the, see what's coming up, the danger? All right, finally. Okay, what's this? That's why I don't like using this because everything is given to you. I would rather make it come step by step. Anyway, what is this? What is density times volume? Wow. Mass. Remember the formula density is mass divided by volume? So density times volume would be the mass of fluid. What is mass multiplied by G called? I'm, I'm so grateful they didn't write it here. What's the product of mass and acceleration due to gravity called? Okay, give me a common word. Yeah, force. But what's that common word? The weight. So, can I just add on to this and say that's going to be the weight of fluid displaced? Would you understand that? Oh my God, she spoiled everything. Please don't add. What are we getting here? This is what? It's the weight of fluid displaced. Not the weight of the solid. It's the weight of fluid displaced. Is what? What is on the left hand side? It's called the buoyant force. Up thrust. The force of the liquid pushing up on the solid. Final formula. This is Archimedes principle. When you put a solid in any fluid, you have to really, if it's a piece of wood, you put it into water, it's going to float, isn't it? Come on now, it's going to float. But what if you want to hold it underwater, wouldn't your hand feel a force pushing back on you? We're talking about that. We're talking about that force. The force that pushes up, how do you calculate that? You multiply the mass of the fluid displaced times G. Did you get it? We'll find out. We'll find out when we do problems whether you got it or not. Well, that is the crown, <laughs> the gold crown and all that. If you observe carefully, you see that on the left-hand side, when you weigh this crown in air, it shows how much? 14.7 kilogram, but as soon as you immerse it in water, it shows you... 13.4. Now you know why, right? So can somebody tell me, what is the mass of water displaced, believing that this is water? What's the mass of water displaced? Easy, isn't it? How do you get it? Subtract. Subtract, right? Because the up thrust is equal to 1 point how much? 1.3. 14.7. Take away 13.4. Any questions there? <coughs> Hold on. If an object floats, then the weight of the floating object is equal to the buoyant force. The weight of the floating object is equal to the buoyant force. I could have made you do a problem just using the diagram. I will not because I've given you problems already. Okay, no questions there.
for a floating object, the fraction that is submerged is given by the ratio of the object's density to that of the fluid. What it means is this. Uh, see, be careful. Do you see two, two densities? One is the density of the object. The other is the density of the... Okay. You use the density of the fluid to calculate the buoyant force. Keep that in your mind. You use the density of the fluid to calculate the buoyant force. Now that one wants to die on me. Okay, I lost it. I knew this would happen. Come on, dear. Don't die. <coughs> All right, I think that's the time to do question number one. Look at question number one, so that we don't waste time. This one died on me. At least you read it. Okay, I got it. I, I wanted to go as I planned it. So, what do you see here? Hot air balloon. Is that hot air balloon floating? Floating in what? So air is the fluid. Come on now, air is the fluid. All right. If you have to, you know that it's floating. Let me say that it's completely floating. Neither moving up nor moving down, right? It's just like that. Can you calculate the weight that's acting down? Well, wouldn't it include the weight of the... Cargo, you see the cargo? Plus the weight of the fabric, the fabric making the balloon, plus the weight of the helium inside. I can see it's a helium balloon. Weight of the helium inside. How many did I say now? It's getting tough. It's getting tough now. The total weight acting down is the weight of the cargo, the weight of the fabric, and everything else that makes the balloon, plus the weight of the helium inside should be equal to, hold on, should be equal to the buoyant force. Okay, give me a formula for buoyant force. Is equal, to, no, 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 is equal to the mass, it's, uh, sorry, is equal to the weight of fluid displaced. Isn't it? What's the fluid being displaced? Air. We're going to find the weight of the air displaced. Okay, how do you find the weight? How do you find the weight? Give me the formula for weight. Mass times G. Okay, what's the formula for mass of fluid? Density of the fluid times the volume times G. Oh my God, are you with me? Okay, tell me again, what's the fluid? Air. So you, be, you need the density of air. And what's this? Volume of so in this case, because the volume is the same, the volumes got cancelled and you get 0 0.8477. Marco, fine, correct? Any units? They cancel out, Tiffany. Okay. It's mass of something divided by mass of something else, so the oh. masses cancel out. Therefore, there is no unit. Specific gravity has no unit. All right. Read number two. Now, the gauge pressure in each of the four tires is 240 kilopascal. First, you have to change it into pascal. Multiply by 1,000. So, P, pressure, is 240 times 1,000. Each tire has a footprint of, you know the meaning of the word footprint there? When it hits the ground, the area that it covers, 220 centimeters squared. Is that a correct unit? All right, you've got to change centimeter squared into meter squared. Somebody tell me how. No. Divide by 100 times 100 because it's a centimeter squared. If you were changing centimeter into meter, just divide by 100. If you're changing centimeter squared into meter squared, divide by 100 times 100. 
Oh, there it is for you. No suspense. So I wrote, the weight should be equal to four times PA. Where did I get that four from? Four tires. What are we trying to find? Aren't we trying to find the mass of the car? Okay, that's why I made M the subject. Four times P times area by G. Right? That is four times... 240 times 10 to the 3 because it's times 1000 times the area is 220 times 10 to the negative 4. I'm showing you how. <coughs> 1 centimeter squared is 10 to the negative 4 meter squared. 100 times 100. And you're dividing it. That's why it's 10 to the negative 4. Okay? So the mass of the car is 2.2 times 10 to the 3 kilogram. Yeah, that's... What is this? Okay, it's not going off. Oh, <laughs> look, I managed to cut that and separate it and bring it down here. You see this? Out. Okay, and this was... Funny things happening here. Yeah, is that correct? So the absolute pressure is P A plus rho G H. Happy? So that would be that times rho G H. So what do you do? Rho G H. 10, 10 raised to 3 is 1000. That's the density of water times 9.8 times height is 2. And so I get it as 1.21 times 10 to the 5 Pascal. You can try to calculate this at home because I will be uploading this today. So you can see the whole lecture and the problems. And check the calculations. So that's the absolute pressure. What else do you need? The total force. Now how do you find the force? From the pressure, how do you find the force? Pressure upon area. Pressure. What? Force, uh, force is pressure upon area. No, no. Pressure is force upon area. So force is pressure multiplied by area. Okay. So how do you find the force? Force is pressure multiplied by area. And what's the area? Multiply the length and the width. So force is pressure multiplied by area. That's, that's the pressure. And the area is 22 times 8.5, isn't it? That's all multiplied, and you get that. Yes, in Newtons. And there is a B part. What does the B part say? What will be the pressure against the side of the pool near the bottom? It's near the bottom. So what do you know? I just told you. When I was teaching, I told you. If it's near the bottom, that means the height is the same. So does it matter whether it's at the bottom or on the side? The pressure is the same. Because the depth is the same. It's the same liquid. So I said P at the side is P at the bottom. Done. That's how I try to save time. Doing all this. The house that's the water tank five meter and then the height is h and you have to find the height of the water tank don't you yes fine no you have to find the water gauge pressure at the house but is the is the figure clear now yes you see the pipeline that brings water that is the pipeline that brings water to the house. Isn't it? But it's green water that flows anyway. Come on. I'll stop it right there. Isn't H the opposite side? 110 is the hypotenuse. So from that you can find H. I did not. And uh, if you can, just find that out. 
And then uh, gauge pressure is rho GH, and you continue. Rho GH is... What am I doing there? Wait, what did I do? That's the important part of this question. What, what is that? Where did I get this from? What's the actual height of water? Yes. Because remember there's water in the tube. I mean water in the pipe. Isn't there water in the pipe? So you don't care whether it's slanting or not. The height of water is actually H plus 5. Are you with me? So that's why you have rho G and the total, and the total height there. 5 plus 110. Okay, now put it. So it's 9.6 times 10 to the 5 Newton per meter squared is what I got as the gauge pressure. Tiffany, can you please read that? The B part? That's how you're going to hear her on YouTube. Okay. Sorry. How, how high Sorry. will the water shoot? No, no. So how do you answer that? A broken pipe in front of the house. A pipe breaking in front of the house, and isn't the water going to shoot up? So how, how high is the water going to shoot up? going to shoot up. It's exactly going to shoot up. Yes, that's the answer. That's the answer. Thank you. you cannot shoot up. It cannot shoot up more than that. So it shoots up to the top of the tank, which is H's 5 plus 110 sign 58, which I think I got as 98 meters. Total weight, the B stands for the balloon there. Total weight is weight of the balloon plus weight of the helium plus weight of the load, which is the cargo. And the total buoyant force is the weight of air displaced. Is that right? The weight acting down is the sum of the weights of those three. And the buoyant force is weight of air displaced. And how do you find the weight of air displaced? Isn't it... Uh, Rho air times volume of the balloon times G. Mm -hmm. I spent a lot of time on that. Are you with me? Yes. Density of air multiplied by the volume of the balloon times G is the total buoyant force. That's where most students have a difficulty. I don't know why. Now, uh, so that means I'm going to equate the two. I'm going to say that they should be equal because I know the balloon floats. Doesn't it say it's floating? Look at the problem. Uh, yeah, it doesn't say it's floating, but it says how large a cargo can it lift? It, that means it has to be just floating, isn't it? Because you're maximizing the cargo. Because if you put anything more than that, it's going to come down. If you put anything less than that, it's going to go up. So they are balanced. Cancel the G's. So I make the mass of the load the subject. Is that sensible mathematically? Is that correct? All I did is take these two quantities onto the other side so they became negative, right? Okay. Okay, I'm showing that that's how it became negative. Uh, I'm just changing the place. Wait, wait, what's that step? Explain, somebody. How do you find the mass of helium? 
density helium times volume of the balloon, right? Come on, stop and think. Is the volume of helium equal to the volume of the balloon? Yeah, it's filling it. So the volume of the balloon is the volume of helium. Okay, and now, now continue. So rho A minus, I take out common, VB is common, that's why I took it out. Because you have the volume of the balloon in two of these terms. You see that there, don't you? So I took it out. And inside I have rho A, which is here, minus rho helium. And then the values are not given. Is it given in that question? I forgot to type in the... It will be given to you. You need not memorize the density where it's 1.2. 1.29. Helium is 0 0.179. All those will be given. What's the formula for volume of a sphere? 4 by 3? Pi r cube. That's why you see 4 by 3 pi radius cube minus 930. That gives you 920 kilograms. This is the maximum mass of cargo that that balloon can lift. Anything more than that is going to come down. Anything less than that is going to keep going up. That is 666 Newton, so she will sink. I felt so bad. But gradually, wait, 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 wait. Why am I saying that she will sink gradually? Exactly. What would have happened if that was exactly equal? What would have happened? She, then she could float anywhere she likes. I mean, that is a particular case not going to happen in real life. You know what I mean? It should be perfectly matched. If one is a little bit more, you know, either she will go up or she will come down. If it's exact, you can make it float anywhere you like. It's balanced. But that's not, that's not going to happen. So gradually, because the difference is not much, right? She's going to sink, but she's going to sink ever so slowly. Okay. Did you get that part? The second step, the total weight is the weight of wood and the weight of lead. PB there is lead. You know PB is the symbol for lead, isn't it? Okay. Okay, so that's the total weight acting down. And on the right side, you have the total volume of wood and lead multiplied by the density of water times G. If this is true, you're understanding much better than many other classes when I teach this. Okay, and then... Let me explain that. Can I cross out the G? Yes. yes, that's what I did in the next step. The G's are gone. And what else did I do? Volume is mass by density. Do you see that? Do you recognize that? Hey, volume of wood is mass of wood by density, and the, and the volume of lead is likewise. Can I go on? What is that? What is that now? I rearranged. Do you see what I did? I tried to bring this term. Ah, this one doesn't write sometimes. Okay. This one, do you see that? On the left side and try to put wherever I see lead. Look. Watch. Is that correct? I try to bring those two terms together. Are you with me? Mm -hmm. And then what I did is, I collected the other two terms, where I have wood on the right side. That's why you see the wood term on the right side and the, the lead one on the left side. Okay.
Now, mass of lead is taken out. So you have 1 minus rho water by a density of water by density of lead. That's the same thing on the right side. That's just math. I just brought these two together. See? Isn't that the same thing here? Just put one underneath the other. And uh, kind of same thing here. Look, that's the same. And I took lead outside, so that's why that's one. Anyway, finally, that's one by 11. Why, why did I put that as one by 11.3? <coughs> yes. Because it's supposed to be density of lead divided by density of water, which is 11.3, right? Okay, because it's the other way. That's why I put it as 1 by 11. And did the same thing on the side. 1 by 0.5, that's given. And uh, now it's simple math to calculate that. Ha, huh, I stopped doing it. That's where I got tired. Okay, so you've got to calculate that. According to the equation of continuity, the mass that flows in is equal to the mass that flows out. Consider a tube. Uh, there's no picture there. Let me draw one. Consider that you have a tube like that, a bigger, wider one that turns into a narrow one. Okay? And here, the area of cross-section is A1. And here, the area of cross-section is A2. Are you watching? And here, the liquid, let's say water is flowing. And here the velocity of flow is V1, here the velocity of flow is V2. Just tell me, which velocity is bigger, V1 or V2? Common sense, isn't it? But the idea is, the idea is the mass, do you recognize that that's the formula for mass? Mass flowing in one second. I'll tell you why. Watch, I'll write it. Rho 1, A1 times L1. Wouldn't this be volume? Area times height? Wow. Area times height is volume, isn't it? Now, if I divide by time, wouldn't this become velocity? Are you watching, guys? So now on the left-hand side, what do you have? I have mass flowing in one second. So the mass that flows in one second is equal to mass that flows out. Do you think that water will stagnate inside? No. Whatever comes in has to flow out. So you can cross out the densities. How can you cross out the densities? If it's the same liquid. If it's the same liquid, and liquids are incompressible, so the density doesn't change. So you cross it out, and you have a wonderful equation, which I want you to take down like this. A1, V1 is equal to A2, V2. Finish. Became much easier. A1, V1 is equal to A2, V2, which means if the area of cross-section is smaller, the velocity would be higher. Would this be like... So an equation that was already there in the 17th century was put to good use in the 20th century. <laughs> you see? 200, 250 years, it just was there with nobody. And people were trying to fly. But they were trying to fly with wings clipped on like birds and flap it and then have legs broken, get hospitalized, and they were thinking about everything else except this. And the Wright brothers, for the first time, picked up the 200-year-old Bernoulli's equation and said, this is how we're going to fly, if we fly at all. So you want to know what Bernoulli's equation is now. And by, after I explain it, well, actually, this equation can be derived, but I'm not going to derive it. I'm just going to explain it. Take a look at this diagram and use as much energy as you have. If you look at this diagram carefully, you see water flowing up a pipe. Do you see that? Mm -hmm. So you see that the heights are different. And water is flowing from, uh, you can see the flow. Look at velocity. Water is actually flowing up, isn't it? Heights are different. What about the velocity of flow? Same or different? Different. Here you have V2, here you have V1, so the heights are different, the velocities are different, and the pressures are different. You see P2 and P1? I talked about three quantities. And do you know that anything that moves has a particular kind of energy? What is that called? Kinetic energy. So the flowing water has kinetic energy, correct? And do you know that anything at a height has another kind of energy? What is that called? 
potential energy. So the sun has potential energy. And I'm introducing a third one called pressure energy because a fluid can be under pressure. According to Bernoulli's principle, the total energy will be a constant. That's all. So if you take the energy at one end and take the energy at the other end, what do you expect? They must be equal. So if you take the pressure energy plus the potential energy plus the kinetic energy at end A and do the same at end B, you must get them exactly the same. Hold on. Before even we come to this relation, watch. Whenever you're asked to do problems, the pipe will be horizontal. Okay? So which energy is the same already? If the pipe is... If the pipe is horizontal, what is the same? Potential energy is the same. So that's taken out of the picture, okay? Now we only have two other energy. What are the two energies? Okay, so now just, just common sense. Tell me this. I'm going to say pressure here is P1. Kinetic energy here is K1. Just P1 plus K1 is going to P2 plus K2. Did that make sense? What does that mean? It means that if the velocity is greater on one side the pressure must be smaller on that side. Just common sense, because when you add them up, you should get the same, isn't it? I'll try to say that again. If the pressure is smaller on one end, it must be flowing faster there. Why? Because the total energy must be the same. So the idea that you take away from here is, if anything flows faster, the pressure there must be smaller. And I, I always mean, what do you see? Reading doesn't make any sense. So what is it? That, this is the wing of an airplane. But your view is across the wings, not like this. You know, you, you're watching it from one end. And so you're seeing the top of the wing curved and the bottom more flat. <coughs> Have you noticed it? It, it? It's not like too big like that. But if you notice it next time, you'll see it is surely correct. It's curved. And then you know that the wings can be tilted too. Come on, during takeoff and... Okay. As the airplane taxis, and you have huge wings, long ones, the air is uh, rushing past the wings, isn't it? When the air reaches this point, it breaks into two parts. One part goes above, the other part goes below. And whatever mass separates here, according to the equation of continuity, the same mass must combine here. Come on now. Right? And if you watch carefully, the upper part is a little bit longer. Which means the air there on top of the wing has to flow a little bit faster. Which means the pressure will be lower. Which means you're going to get sucked up. Come on now, because there's a pressure difference between the bottom of the wing and the top. As the airplane continues, there's going to be a reduction of pressure all the time on top of the wing. The pressure is going to be smaller than below. So if I give you the pressure difference, let me say PB, P bottom, and PA. You know the pressure difference is PB minus PA. And if you multiply that with the area of the wings, which is quite big, you will get the maximum weight that the aircraft can carry. I hope you understood, did you? The pressure B minus the pressure A multiplied by the total area of the wings, that's the maximum weight that the airplane can carry. That's why the luggage that we are allowed to carry is restricted. Because they've calculated the average mass of a person calculated what extra luggage you can put there and uh, they have to keep it well below the limit, you know, for safety purposes. So that's why they try to, you know, charge you by saying, okay, if you take more than one, you have to pay, trying to make you carry less. I hope you understood, did you? Okay. Watch. Last thing that we do. The ball has two kinds of motion. One, it's moving forward. Two, it's spinning, right? Because of the forward motion of the ball, 
you will have air rushing past backwards. And because of the spin motion, you will have the air near it. That's very important. It's not shown in the diagram. The air surrounding it spinning in the same direction. That makes sense? Okay, let me add that to the diagram. I didn't know why they did not do that. Okay, so you have the air here spinning that way and the air here spinning this way. Are you with me? You got it? Okay, so the forward motion causes the air to go back, both sides. Spin motion and the air surrounding it is carried with it. That's common sense, isn't it? Because it's touching it. Just like if you rotate a ball in water, you would see the water near it moving in the same direction. That's kind of, okay. So if you watch carefully now, you see that on this side, you have air flowing in two opposite directions, back and forward. So they kind of try to destroy each other's velocity, so it's going to be smaller here. But on this side, you watch carefully, you see that the air is flowing in the same direction. Both the spin and back. So the velocity on this side is going to be obviously bigger. Where the velocity is bigger, the pressure is lower. So the ball is surely going to swing that way. Did you get it? So if you throw the ball straight, you throw it straight, but you spin it when you throw it, it's not going to go straight. The guy threw it straight, but it's going to go. And if he spins it that way, when he throws it, it's going to go that way. I have explained, or rather tried to explain why.